Okie dokie, here we are. My name is Terry Schneider. For those who don't know me, I'm the Executive Director of the Stoughton Chamber of Commerce, who is sponsoring this event. I thank everybody for coming and participating along with us. Uh, just a couple of thank yous I want to uh, put out there. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Stop and Shop for donating some of our refreshments in the Utanus Room. Thank the uh, Candidates Committee, um, which is made up of Cindy Bizarro, who is the chair, Jeffrey Pickett, and Erin Lockhart. I want to thank, thank Michael Hammond for uh, being our moderator. And Christine Yacobacci, did I pronounce it? Yeah, Christine Yacobacci Close, who is doing our time cards. Thank you, Christine. I uh, want to thank SMAC, um, who are actually filming tonight, and it is live tonight, and it will also be on Comcast Channel 9 and Verizon Channel 28 um, at times to be determined. Um, certainly thank you to our candidates for uh, being here tonight, and thank you to those who are in attendance. There are going to be cards available, um, which you can check with me on for possible questions from the audience if there is time, so time permitting. And um, lastly, if you have phones, please put them on in silence or turn them off. And now we'll turn this over to Michael Hammond, our moderator. Thank you. Um, I would first like to thank the Chamber of Commerce and Cindy Pizarro for having me back this year. I appreciate being asked. I look forward to this every year. Um, as Terry said, this evening's Candidates Forum is being recorded and broadcast live by Student Media Access Corporation. It is currently being aired on Comcast Channel 9 and Verizon 28, which is our public channel, and our government channel as well, which is Comcast 98 and Verizon 24. And to get started, um, we have one candidate running unopposed for town moderator, and that is Adam Dawkins, and he is here to make a statement. Thank you very much, Michael, and thank you so very much to the Stoughton Chamber of Commerce and to all of you who are present this evening and to everyone who's watching from home. Uh, it's wonderful to be among you. My name is Adam Dawkins, and I'm running for re-election as Stoughton's town moderator. Um, you may be starting to think of me as something of a fixture at these candidate forums, and that's because our town charter gives the moderator a one-year term. Uh, and so the moderator runs for re-election every year and therefore participates in these candidate forums every year. Um, so for the third year in a row, I am running for town moderator. When I succeeded, our friend and my friend Howard Hansen in this role two years ago, uh, I had a great deal to learn about this position, and Howard was incredibly helpful to me and, and still continues to be very helpful to me. The town moderator's most visible responsibility is to preside over Stoughton's town meeting, and over the past two years, I've also come to learn much more about the less visible details of my role. There are also many organizational aspects of this role in the months that lead up to an annual or, um, uh, or, or special town meeting. Uh, I rely on a collaborative relationship with our dedicated professional staff here at Town Hall in addition to the chairs of our, of our town meeting standing committees. It takes a great deal of work and a lot of time to get ready for town meeting and I'm grateful to everyone who devotes so much of their time to ensure a successful meeting. We're currently in the midst of preparing for the 2019 annual town meeting now. Um, I am delighted that so many people have taken out papers to run for town meeting representative this year. Uh, when I first ran for office, I said that I'd love to see a day where every precinct uh, is, is a competitive race for town meeting reps because it's such a privilege to participate in a process in which citizens like us can actively shape the destiny of our community. Uh, so more precincts will be competitive this year than have been in quite some time. And while Stoughton's town meeting has a reputation, even across all of Massachusetts as being a very tough town meeting, uh, that's a reputation I think we should be proud of uh, because, it's, because Stoughton's citizens care. Uh, we're engaged and while the moderator's official opinion on matters before our town meeting is that the moderator has no opinion, I can share, I, I know that I share with each of you a deep desire for the brightest possible future for the town that we all call home. Town meeting affords us the opportunity to actively shape that future, and as long as I am your moderator, I pledge to always preside over a meeting with a fair legislative process where a rich diversity of ideas can be heard so that we might land at the best possible outcome for our town today and for tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. 
Okay, and now we are going to move on to the redevelopment authority candidates. We have incumbent Michael Barrett and his challenger, Mark Zemanian. And before we get into the debate portion, I'd like to go over the rules. Each candidate will be given 90 seconds for um, a closing statement and will be allowed 90 seconds to respond to each question and a rebuttal is available as well for 60 seconds if either of you would like to take that opportunity. Um, so I'm gonna start with you, Michael Barrett. And the first question is, if you're elected to the Stoughton Redevelopment Authority, what will your contribution be? Thank you. Um, green light. If I'm elected or re-elected to the Redevelopment Authority, I would like and look forward to the opportunity to continue trying to be a positive force in creating the type of partnership that I believe is truly needed across the town, various boards. Um, I think I've served and been productive on the SRA for the past six years, as well as on the Community Preservation Committee, both in being a strong proponent for open meetings, for, for transparency in everything that we do do, in encouraging uh, public input where we can get it, um, but mostly in pushing to become a true partner with the Board of Selectmen, with the Planning Board, with the Community Preservation Committee. I think what we need as a town is more people working together for a common goal. We're very fortunate. We have a lot of people who have great ideas and, and are really sincere about what they want in the town. They feel very strongly about it. If we could just succeed in bringing them together to work together to accomplish that, I think we will find ourselves more successful down the road. So it's hopefully what I will bring to the table. Thank, Thank you. you. Mark? Same question? Yes. What will I bring to the board? I'm going to bring transparency to the board. I'm going to bring accountability. And I'm going to bring commitment. I believe firmly in this town, in the people of this town. Although, I'm going to work with the people of this town. Not just the government and other boards, which is an important factor. But I want to hear from the residents. This is their, t this is their town. It's not ours. It's all of ours. I will bring private-public partnerships to the town. I will work hard to work with developers in town to ensure that Stoughton gets the best possible representation. Let's put this, the cost of, of redeveloping our town center, let's put it on the developers, not the taxpayers. Taxpayers should never carry the burden of redeveloping a town. Thank you. Would you like to use your rebuttal or? No, we can. Excellent. All right, we'll move on to the next question, and this one will go to Mark first. What is the role of the Redevelopment Authority? Well, I, I did a little history study on this, and Redevelopment Authority was uh, put into action in 1963 by vote at town meeting, uh, and its primary focus then was the North Stoughton Technology Center Drive, um, that area. In 2014, the uh, SRA's bylaws were changed and the focus became the downtown. That was approximately five years ago now, and our downtown sadly is in worse shape now than it has ever been. Um, so my understanding of the purpose of the SRA is to bring revitalization back into the town, and I would do that, again, through private-public partnerships, not on the taxpayers. Okay. Michael, same question. Okay. The, um, as Mark indicated, the SRA was formed by town, town meeting vote back in 1963. Uh, the, the Redevelopment Authority is an agency of the state authorized under Mass General Law Section 121B. And what that does is it, it allows a city or a town, through the use of a redevelopment agency, it grants an arm to, to do a lot of planning, um, to, to help redevelop and certainly to address areas of urban blight and whatnot in the town. It spells out some very specific rules about what can and cannot be done, including a tremendous amount of public input, which is what we had done a couple of years ago. Um, the SRA, the, the North Stoughton Industrial Park project was, was completed a long time ago and the SRA was kind of working on various things and had been asked back in 2011 or 12 to focus on the downtown by the Board of Selectmen. When I got in and 
was appointed chairman, we updated the bylaws, as Mark indicated, to reflect what was the reality of going on. The real role of the SRA is to be a partner and to help carry out the redevelopment as per the wishes of the residents of the town, the Board of Selectmen, the Planning Board, the Master Plan, and anybody else that's interested. And my, my whole agenda for the past five or six years has been to try to develop those partnerships. The planning piece is easy. It's been done. It's not easy. It's been done over and over again. There are plans sitting in bookcases here at Town Hall and at our office. It's a matter of creating the partnership and moving forward. Okay. This next question is going to you first, Michael. What is your opinion of each of the following potential pur purchases by the town? The State Theater, the train station, and the post office? I think any one of them. Um, I think all three of them are potentially great opportunities for the town to make a big difference in the center of the town. Um, I think it's very ambitious to think of trying to do more than one of them at this point in time, but the old story is always going to be that if you don't do it, you may lose it. If the State Theater is torn down, then we never have a chance to restore the State Theater. We could do something else at that property. Um, so all three of them are potentially great projects. All three of them potentially involve a lot of money. Mark and I both feel very strongly, I think, that we need to be very cognizant of the potential burdens on the taxpayer, that we don't have unlimited funds available. The SRA doesn't, nor does the town. The, the, the role we need to play, we got to create the type of environment that would encourage private development to come in. We need to partner with them. We may need to prime the pump, if you will, to get the thing, to get certain projects started, but that is the role we're supposed to play. It's a role that I think is far better played if we're all on the same page, and by we all, again, I mean the Board of Selectmen, the Redevelopment Authority, the Planning Board, the Community Preservation Committee has a potential role. They have funds available through that, but that's a different topic. Um, if we all get together, we can get one of those projects or more, and we can get them done, and we can do it in a way that doesn't overburden our taxpayers. Thank you. Same question, Mark. Thank you. So the, let's take the first one off the table. In 2015, I believe, or 16, I, I believe it was 2015, town meeting voted to uh, allot up to $350,000 to purchase the train station. Not sure why that hasn't happened as of yet, but to me that is already a done deal. So I voted for it. I'm in, I'm in approval of it. I have no issue with the train station. One thing I will say about the train station and all these three projects that you spoke of is that we need a process. There doesn't seem to be any process in place. Um, what are we going to do with these buildings? What are we going to do with the properties when we do buy them? It was town meetings wish that we purchase this train station. So again, I'd, I'd like to see that happen. As far as the state theater goes, I stand on what I said at last Monday's debate. I have no issue with it, but it must be done with private funding. It, you cannot put the burden on the taxpayers, plain and simple. The post office, why don't we focus on the two things in front of us? I, I think to reach out on the post office, again, is just asking an awful lot of this town. And I think our, our focus has to be on very small projects so that we can accomplish them and then move on to the next project, rather than moving in many different directions at once. So focus, process, accountability. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, this next question is going to you first, Mark. What should the criteria be for the SRA to be allowed to either directly purchase property or assist the town in purchasing property? So um, it is my understanding that an urban renewal plan was developed uh, by the SRA. A lot of time and, and money was put into that urban renewal plan. Um, I've had a chance to review that in, in some degree, to some degree, and although I question some things, I think overall it could be a, a beneficial plan, um, specifically making 10,000 square foot lots available so that developers together and jointly can work to improve on parts of the, the town center. Um, 
However, that urban renewal plan hasn't been ratified. It hasn't been followed through. It's never been before the planning board, to my knowledge, um, and I asked. It has never been before town meeting, and it has never been to the Massachusetts legislature, which is, again, part of that process. So we have a potentially good plan in place, and as Michael said, there are many plans here available, but none of them seem to move forward. My intent would be to move that plan forward, go before the planning board, find out if there's any mistakes in that through them, rectify those mistakes, bring it to town meeting, get this ratified, get this finished, so that it can be of value to the SRA and to the town. Thank you. Michael? Okay, I'm, I'm glad to hear that Mark, Mark did some research and looked at the plan. The simple answer, not to oversimplify the, the question about what criteria, state, the, the legislation, the state law dictates under what conditions the authority can purchase property. And the primary one and the, and the main intent of a redevelopment authority is to put together an urban redevelopment plan which would be presented to the Board of Selectmen. It would be validated by the planning board who needs to assure the state that it is, it is um, consistent with the town's master plan. Then it would go on to DHCD, and as, as much as town meeting is interested in, there is no requirement to present the plan to town meeting, um, nor does it go to the legislature. It goes to DHCD after it has been vetted through the Board of Selectmen and Planning Board. On two separate occasions, the SRA brought that plan back to the Board of Selectmen because we had kind of come up to about 90% of the work we wanted to do, and the one thing we didn't have was a consensus of what project would serve as the center stone of that. And we said to the prior Board of Selectmen, not the current, we need to work together to come up with a plan, and we heard nothing back for over a year. When the new board came in, they invited us back in. We came in and we talked to them, and since then there's been a lot of activity working with the Downtown Redevelopment Committee, as well as the, the SRA and others. And so, like Mark says, the intent is to take that plan, finish it off, present it to DHCD, and move forward. Okay. Could I? Rebuttal? Sure. Yeah, I, I, I would like to. You, during your statement, Michael, you talked a lot about the Board of Selectmen. Um, to be frank with you, the Board of Selectmen is part of that process, but should happen once that plan has gone through the planning board and once that plan has gone to town meeting, then it should go to town meeting in conjunction with the Board of Selectmen. The Board of Selectmen should not be the ones that are dictating to the SRA what's happening. The SRA should be identifying these cornerstone properties and moving them forward. Michael, would you like to respond? I, Mark seems to be rewriting state law. I, I don't know what to say. We brought law, in. We brought in some outside consultants. We went through a year and a half long process. We took all the appropriate steps, lined it all up. The decision was the town needs to come up with the consensus. The planning board role is merely to agree that that plan is consistent with the master plan, which we have no doubt that it is, and we'll, we'll deal with that. The planning board was a part of, was invited to all of our public forums. But the way the legislation is written, the way the process is written, it doesn't go off to where Mark wants to bring it. It goes through the Board of Selectmen and the Planning Board to DHCD. Okay. Not Thank sure. you. Uh, we have one final question, and this is going to Michael first. Other than the downtown, what do you see as priorities for development in Stoughton? Other than downtown, I mean, there are areas along 139 going out towards the highways that I think, I think the whole area going down Pearl Street, any one of them could become very important areas for redevelopment. Uh, certainly the, the last five or six years the Redevelopment Authority has been totally focused on the downtown area, again at the request of the Board of Selectmen, inconsistent with the master plan that was put together by the master plan committee which was an offshoot of the planning board. Um, so there are other areas, but my personal preference, my belief, is it really does belong downtown, is, is the primary place for us to work. Thank you. Mark, same question. Well, I, I would actually agree with Michael. The downtown area is the primary area to be worked on. I know there's some areas over on Route 27 
that would seem to be open to redevelopment. However, um, there's a number of different logistical issues in that area, such as sewer and, and other things. And the residents really don't want that area overly developed. Um, I think most of, of this town, the residents themselves at least, would, have been, would be in agreement. Most people moved here because it was a, not an urban area, but a rural area. Um, so I, I really think that redevelopment authority long before Michael or I were, were around um, did a fine job up at technology, up at technology center. Um, I think very little has been done in the downtown area and I think that's where the focus needs to be for the planning board. And it's certainly what I've been told by the residents is the focus they want from redevelopment. Thank you. Okay, so um, each of you have 90 seconds for a closing statement. We'll start with you, Michael. Okay, first I'd like to thank the Chamber for sponsoring tonight's event and for the folks from SMAC who are here working, uh, trying to keep us all informed. Personally, I find this to be a great opportunity to speak directly to the voters here in the room and on TV um, and to talk about the issues that are on everybody's minds and give some insight. I think this is especially important because all too often it feels like social media has become the primary source of information and public discourse regarding many town issues. As we all know, social media does not always present the whole picture and can become a very divisive me medium. Fortunately, it also serves as a reminder that we can be part of the process by becoming actively involved in running for town. And as such, I'd like to thank my fellow candidates, Mark and, and the other folks who will be up here later, for what they have done and what they're trying to do for the town of Stoughton. Personally, I've lived in Stoughton for 34 years. I still consider myself somewhat of a newcomer to town politics. I've been on the SRA and the Community Preservation Committee for six years now. My professional background was in corporate finance with a strong focus on real estate development process and for a large retail company. I have a lot of experience in process improvement, change management, and organizational design skills which I think are very valuable to the SRA. Um, I hope tonight's debate, as well as last week's candidate forum, has given you a clearer picture of my qualifications. During these forums, my opponent has talked a lot about tr transparency and protecting the interests of residents of Stoughton and Wallace. However, he's not once mentioned his efforts to obtain a million dollars from the town to buy a piece of property and stop a local development in his neighborhood. I'm not. Okay. Thank you. Mark? Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for watching this and being here this evening. Accountability, commitment, and transparency. You've heard these three things from me often. That's because of the fundamental problems I see with our current relationship, our leadership, sorry. Promises to town meter, meeting members and residents that have not been kept. Taxpayers should not be, always be stuck with the bill. Bringing interested developers to our town requires commitment. You must have representation from your government seven days a week, something my opponent can't commit to. It can require meetings during business hours, something my opponent can't do if he's out of town much of the week. I live in Stoughton. My business operates here. I can and will devote my time to ensure your desires for our downtown are met to the best of the SRA's abilities. I will work with all town boards and staff to ensure the SRA is committed to the process of bringing prosperity to our town. I will bring true transparency to your government, making myself available to speak with residents and offering office hours. I will ensure that meetings are televised and plenty of advance notice given for our residents. I welcome the residents' involvement. It is, after all, your town. Stoughton is a great town, one filled with honest, hard-working people, and I'm proud to be here as a resident. I'm asking for your vote on April 9th, and I thank you. Thank you. On behalf of the Chamber of Commerce, I'd like to thank both of you for attending this evening. I would also like to remind viewers that Election Day is Tuesday, April 9th, and the polls will be open from 7 a.m. until 8 p.m., and Stoughton Media Access will be bringing you live election results that evening. The time will be determined shortly after the polls close. And also be sure to visit www.stoughtontv.com for all election coverage. And we're going to take a quick break and we'll be back with the school committee candidates. Thank you.
Welcome back. We are going to move on to the school committee portion of our debate. Um, welcome to the Chamber of Commerce Candidates Forum. And the school committee has two seats available and three candidates. And the candidates are incumbent Anita Hill, former school committee member Dr. Erdem Ural, and also incumbent Joe McDonough. Joe was invited to attend this evening and declined. He was also invited to submit a statement and also declined. Before we start, I would like to um, go over the rules once more. Each candidate will be given 90 seconds for a closing statement. Each candidate will be allowed 90 seconds to answer each question. And if you would like the opportunity for a rebuttal, we will allow one for 60 seconds. I would like to thank Christine Yakabuchi, our timekeeper as well. Okay, so I'm going to start with Dr. Erdem Ural with the first question, and that is, what are some things you hope to accomplish in a three-year term on the school committee? Uh, this is a really uh, exciting time for the uh, school, school district uh, because we have a new high school uh, that will, uh, will take possession, I think, in July, and uh, we have a new superintendent coming in. So, uh, you know, the sky is the limit. Uh, one of the things that I want to deal with is uh, there is a big split be between the uh, uh, One Pearl Street and the uh, uh, Stoughton uh, School District. So I'd like to uh, bring, uh, man, it's one minute already, uh, bring a uh, uh, bridge, try to bridge the, I'll, I'll work with my uh, fellow school committee members and try to bridge the gap because uh, uh, I have been to uh, a finance committee meeting and I've watched the school committee uh, meetings. Things are getting really ugly. We don't need to do that. We have one town and we should have uh, one team. So that's my uh, number one priority. Uh, my number two priority is uh, in the past, uh, past three years, the school committee has uh, done some, um, uh, displayed some uh, poor judgment. Uh, so if there is a question, I would uh, like to explain what I mean by that. So uh, I would like to uh, uh, work with my fellow members to uh, restore the credibility of the school committee and the administration. Then we got the uh, diversity issues, we got the uh, uh, student achievement issues, and the uh, protection of the uh, children and taxpayers. Thank you. Same question, Anita. Thank you. What I hope to accomplish in the next three years is basically, everybody says it, to continue what I've been doing, continue to work on the process, to continue to work on budgets, continue to work on what's best for all of our students. Obviously, the new superintendent is top on the list. Superintendent is going to be also learning the ropes. But I'm hoping that we can work together closely with him and ask him what plans, what programs worked in Sharon, what worked, what didn't work. We can learn from each other doing that and develop future programs from that. He is the one who, the superintendent, along with his admin team, is the ones who would set curriculum, but the, but the superintendent does keep us highly abreast of what's going on there. So I'm just hoping that we could really move the kids forward. New High School is a prime location for it. We just had a tour of it on Saturday. It's still a lot of cement and bricks, but it's looking beautiful. Excellent, thank you. And speaking of the superintendent, this next question goes to Anita. How would you define the working relationship between the superintendent and the school committee? And do you foresee a different dynamic with the newly appointed superintendent? The working relationship with the school superintendent. School committee members are charged with hiring, terminating, and evaluating a school superintendent as one of their duties. We work very closely with the superintendent. The existing superintendent has kept us abreast of any and all issues that are supposed to come before the school committee. Like I said, there's a dividing line between what the superintendent handles with her, her, their administration and between what the school committee needs to, know, needs to know and needs to glean from the superintendent for their responsibilities. Our responsibilities are to approve a budget. We, the five of us, don't make the budget ourselves. It's presented to us. There's discussion, there's questions, lots of questions as for what is being spent and how it's being spent. We approve, we eventually approve a final number that then goes to town meeting. There's also uh, policies. We've, and the entire school committee has voted on updating all the school committee policies. We've used the MASC 
uh, guidelines and templates, and they're actually now all current, and we keep them current. They're online for everybody to see. So those are all involving the school committee and the superintendent working as a one team. Thank you. Talk to your uh, Michael, I, I'm sorry, the acoustics is really bad, and I have a foreigner ear. So sure, I, I will repeat could the you, question. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, give the full question. Again, How would you define the working relationship between the superintendent and the school committee, and do you foresee a different dynamic with the newly appointed superintendent? Um, I, I think uh, I, I see a uh, new dynamic because uh, the new superintendent is uh, more. I looked at his resume and I watched his uh, uh, interview. He's uh, academically strong. Uh, it's a, a big improvement. So I think he will be more uh, in tune with uh, uh, improving the student achievement. Uh, I, I hope uh, you know he's more uh, straightforward. Uh, with the have a uh, you know uh, more willing to, because I heard him say in his interview that he's uh, willing to reach out to the uh, town and the uh, town manager. Uh, to make things uh, more uh, harmonious and, uh, you know, with the one town idea. So uh, I, I think that will uh, be uh, improving. But I uh, disagree with uh, Ms. Hill. Uh, the, school co the budget is a uh, school committee's budget. So the superintendent, uh, uh, you know, may uh, come up with proposals. I mean, I, I look at the history of the proposed uh, numbers. They keep uh, going back and back and back. And then uh, I heard the superintendent say, um, that, uh, you know, this budget is, uh, uh, doesn't have the uh, full numbers, it's going to, uh, it has some cushion in it. Uh, I, I think the uh, budget should reflect, uh, you know, the, the school committee gives the educational goals of the district, and then the budget should be more firm. And uh, there is, uh, I can tell you later on, the, uh, oh, sorry. Thank you. Rebuttal, please. Mm -hmm. The budget is not made by the school committee. It is presented to the school committee from the superintendent. She starts in July or August. She gets her administration team together. They work on a level service. The first thing they do is level service. They roll everything forward and they go from there. The final product, the initial final product, is presented to the school committee as a whole. It's discussed. It's debated. It's the final product is approved by December 31st. It has to be submitted in order to go for approval to the board, to submission by the Board of Selectmen into town meeting. Dr. Well, I, I uh, disagree. I think uh, Ms. Hill is saying the same thing, is that the uh, school committee has a strong, of course, the superintendent comes with the first draft, and uh, the school committee, of course. I mean, uh, it would be ridiculous if the school committee had to vote on the uh, on the superintendent's budget. So there is a, uh, a process, feedback process, uh, the budget gets modified, okay? And uh, I mean, in fact, I heard the uh, superintendent at the finance committee meeting uh, last Thursday, she was saying, you know, we, the school committee, we reduced the budget by this much again. Uh, so uh, it's facetious to say that the uh, superintendent makes the budget and school committee has no fault in uh, requiring more money than uh, that's needed for that budget. Okay, continuing uh, on the subject of the budget, this Could question you goes slowly, first. speak slowly, Mike? I'm so sorry. Mm -hmm. Could you speak more slowly sure. and a little louder, maybe? Okay, uh, this question is for you. Okay. Uh, the school committee is pushing to have its proposed budget fully funded. At the present time, this will require cuts to the municipal budget. Where do you propose cuts be made so that the school department budget can be fully funded? Um, that, that's a great question. Uh, the school committee has been, uh, has came up with, um, this, where was the handout uh, that was passed? In uh, November, they came up with a 5.7% increase. And then uh, in um, December, they uh, reduced it to a 4.52% increase. In uh, January, they reduced it to 3.75% 3 increase. Um, so uh, the, there is a lot of things to be cut in the budget because uh, the superintendent acknowledged that uh, in the FinCom meeting Thursday, uh, somebody asked, uh, you know, because when a teacher uh, is a senior, senior teacher, makes like a maybe $90,000, $100,000. When you replace that person, the, the new replacement, comes in at $40,000. So that's, uh, you know, 
maybe a $50,000 uh, cost savings for uh, retired teachers, uh, new teachers coming in. So somebody asked, you know, does that budget have the, uh, uh, these numbers? She said, uh, no, we don't budget it that way, so it has the uh, current numbers. The other thing is uh, the new budget has the superintendent's salary as if this superintendent is in office. But hopefully, you know, we'll be getting up with the new superintendent is being hired at a lower salary. So this budget is not realistic. It's overblown. And the uh, superintendent said, uh, you know, just give us the money at the end. If we don't use it, we'll return it to the town. Anita? The only thing that Dr. Ural was correct in were the percentages of the budget that were presented. Yes, we are down to a 3.43 increase over last year. Like I said, it's level serviced. We have asked for three additional uh, teachers' aides in the special education department. We have asked for um, one new English language learner teacher because our students, there were 50 to 60 new students that required language, English language teaching. And also, we had to bring the nurse uh, teacher into the budget because she was previously funded by a grant. So those are the basic increases. We, we know we're short from what the town side has dictated to us, but there's going to be meetings. There's going to be a meeting with the Board of Selectmen to go over the original split of the joint accounts. There's also in our proposal, Dr. Rizzi came up with options of where that money could come from. There could be a think on reserve. They're looking at the stabilization uh, reserve. And the revenue figures, as anyone who's been involved in town meeting knows, revenue figures continually to change right up until and sometimes through town meetings. So we're, we, we will work together to work it out. Thank you. Um, just to, uh, she said I'm uh, incorrect on what I said. I mean, I'd like to point out just one example. Superintendent's salary in the new budget is $185,000. We would be fools if you are paying an unexperienced new superintendent 185. I don't know, Ms. Hill probably knows how much uh, we uh, uh, hired the new superintendent for, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm betting it's not 185. And everything I said, go look at the teacher's contract. Look at the, uh, how much is an experienced teacher get versus a new teacher. Uh, $40,000, $50,000 cost savings. It's not reflected in this budget. Um, also, a last debate I pointed out, uh, I was uh, first involved in school committee in 2008. Over, until uh, now, over the last 10 years, we have a growth. The number of students have decreased, but the uh, number of uh, administrators, people with uh, big salaries, have increased. So first thing I would look at is uh, those, uh, do we really need those positions? Thank you. Would you like to respond? Well, that's a Yes. <laughs> Dr. Ural states that the superintendent's salary is in there at her full amount, and that's correct because level service, you roll it forward. Anything, and, and people in town meeting know also that at the end of the school year budget, if there are any monies left, school committee, school district has turned back to the town anywhere from $30,000 up to $300,000. It's not that we want to keep it. It's that we have to plan for it. People leave during the year. We require teachers to give us written notice if they want to take the early retirement. Someone who doesn't want to take early retirement can still retire, but they don't necessarily announce that, and sometimes they don't hold to that announcement. So we can't take advantage, we can't project Retirements and bank on it. Thank you. Um, um, we're going to move on to the next rebuttal. question. Thank you. Um, this question goes first to Anita. Prior to Thanksgiving in 2016, there was an anti -Semitic, Semitic incident at Stoughton High. The response to this incident led to the punishment of three SHS teachers, all of whom appealed to the varying levels of discipline. Within the last year, Two arbiters determined the school committee had overreached in its disciplining of two of the three teachers and either fully or partially overturned their punishments. Given this, how do you reflect on the school committee's handling of the teacher's discipline? First of all, the anti-Semitic instances were hor horrific and they're horrific for any school district where they happen and unfortunately um, Stoughton does not stand alone in them. Um, 
the incidences were brought to our attention, and at the time, obviously, everything has to be an executive session. Executive session are not live. We can't publish it. The grievances that were filed and the, the um, issues that we had to go through took time. The arbitrator, actually, that or mediator, I'm not sure which person it was for, for the decisions in those cases, those were judgments found against the district, and yes, we stand as the district, but they weren't our decisions at the time that those, those uh, disciplines were handed down. They, we didn't do those. We were handed those as already a done deal, that those had been done, and we had to support them and go along with them. The cases that are still in discussion, they're still in litigation, and they're still private, so there's a lot of things that we can't talk about. Thank you. Would you like the question repeated? Uh, it, that, that would be nice, okay. thank you. Prior to Thanksgiving in 2016, there was an anti-Semitic incident at Stoughton High. The response to this incident led to the punishment of three SHS teachers, all of whom appealed the varying levels of discipline. Within the last year, two arbiters determined the school committee had overreached in its disciplining of two of the three teachers and either fully or partially overturned their punishments. Given this, how do you reflect on the school committee's handling of the teacher's discipline? Um, the, uh, the teachers uh, do not get disciplined by the uh, uh, school committee. It gets dis they get disciplined by the uh, principal and by the uh, superintendent. Uh, but the uh, school committee hopefully uh, imparted a proper, uh, uh, proper uh, culture into both of these uh, key people. So I think it was unconscionable that the uh, teacher got suspended and then uh, it was found that uh, she wasn't guilty and she was restored and we paid her back. So essentially, uh, through the uh, principal and through the uh, uh, superintendent, school committee punished the kids. Uh, so I think that's, uh, that's unconscionable. The other uh, example I want to give you is um, uh, there was one incident that uh, improper relations uh, of a teacher with, the, um, uh, with, the, uh, with a student. Uh, in that case, the uh, principal uh, had to report it to the police. She didn't. Uh, and she, she had a duty to do it, but the, what did the school committee do? She, uh, they elected that person to be their finalist for the superintendent search. So that shows you that uh, there is a big judgment issue with the school committee, and I'd like to uh, get a, become a part of the school committee so I can at least bring these to the surface so people, people get into discussion. Thank you. Would you like to respond? Yep. Dr. Ural should know that many of these matters are private. This particular instance with the student and the teacher had been dealt with. We cannot go into it further because there is still ongoing litigation. There's many, many things that you probably may never know, only because we don't go out and publish it. We don't go out and tout that, oh, look, we were right or they were wrong. The school committee, again, like I said, we're presented with a situation that has happened. We're not there in real time. The superintendent comes to us and tells us the decisions that have been made. We support the superintendent's decisions. We are aware of the entire story. And once you, if and when you find out the entire story, we hope that you will understand our decisions. Thank you. Uh, supporting the superintendent's every single decision is a problem that this uh, school committee and the culture is uh, suffering from. So you need to question, you need to understand, and at least you know, give them the values of the town. And uh, we are elected here to give the administration the values of our uh, supporters, of our uh, voters. So uh, the example I gave you, two examples, uh, um, that shows the double standard in the school committee. In one case, the teacher did something, it was, I thought it was good, um, uh, and she got suspended. The other one case, uh, you know, the uh, improper sexual relationship with the teacher, the principal didn't report it, didn't have the police investigated before the evidence became uh, uh, spoiled. Uh, the school committee did not suspend her. They should have suspended her and let the police investigate it. Thank you. We're moving on to the next question, and this goes to you first, Dr. Ural. Please speak slowly. Sure. 
The following is taken from the new policy regarding professional conduct in maintaining boundaries. An appropriate boundary invasion example for non-guidance counseling staff is encouraging students to confide their personal or family problems and or relationships. If a student initiates such discussions, staff members are expected to refer the student to appropriate guidance and counseling staff. What do you view as potential ramifications to a student losing the ability to confide in a trusted staff member? Um, I haven't, uh, I must admit, I haven't read that policy, but um, it, it is, uh, I see some problems in there. I, I don't know if I understood uh, what you read uh, fully, but um, you know, teachers, uh, when I was a kid in uh, elementary school, middle school, high school, teachers were like a, a second mom or a safety net. You know, you should be able to tell your problems to the teacher and uh, get guidance from them. And uh, if there is a need, you should be able to uh, get help from them. They can uh, find the resources. So I, I see some problems there. And I know uh, a few teachers uh, that are uh, you know, concerned about that. And uh, you know, I, I certainly appreciate that. Thank you. Could you repeat the question, sure. please? Absolutely. The following is taken from the new policy regarding professional conduct and maintaining boundaries. An appropriate boundary invasion example for non-guidance counseling staff is encouraging students to confide their personal or family problems and or relationships. If a student initiates such discussions, staff members are expected to refer the student to appropriate guidance counseling staff. What do you view as potential ramifications to a student losing the ability to confide in a trusted staff member? I'm sure everybody, every stu everyone, when they were a student, had at least one uh, teacher that they really liked, really trusted, really wanted, you know, was one of their, felt like they're one of their friends, and that's a great relationship, and many of our teachers have those relationships. It becomes a borderline gray area when the teacher is too, the student is too dependent on the teacher or too con confiding to that teacher. Teachers are human also. So we have to establish some kind of policy and procedure and the teacher needs to know where to draw the line and refer that student to a guidance counselor. A guidance counselor is also not a licensed therapist, so, but the guidance counselor has the tools to be able to make the judgment to see if that student needs further attention or not. It shouldn't be on the teacher themselves because sometimes they're too close to the subject. We, they need to maintain their boundaries. That's what the policy states in itself. You know, personal and family, if, you, if, you're, if your dog died and, and you're sad, that, that's fine. But if it becomes more, teachers need to report, and that's, that's the law. Thank you. I just wanted to also point out that uh, uh, you know, if you follow that to the letter, we don't have enough uh, guidance counselors. Uh, you know, you, the teacher should be uh, involved. And... Uh, Guidance counselor may not be the right person. You know, we have school psychologists, but the school psychologist doesn't see anybody. I mean, at least I, my kid, uh, I tried to see the school psychologist. I couldn't. Uh, so this is a, a vague policy. It's uh, hard to figure out, uh, you know, the, the boundary. It's a policy about boundaries, but, uh, I mean, the words you read to me, they are vague. There is no... Uh, clear boundary. Would you like to respond? I'm good. Thank you. Moving on to the next question. This will go to you first, Anita. Do you think there is a morale issue at Stoughton High School? School, And if so, how do you think the school committee can help to improve morale? You didn't mention teachers, correct? No, just... Uh, at the high school. Just a general morale issue overall. It depends, and that uh, morale is, is a perception, unless you can get people to honestly discuss it with you. Uh, morale can be boosted with a simple thing like a pizza party, whether it's the students or the teachers or the administration. Um, it, the whole thing comes down to conversations and communication. If there's an issue, if there's a problem, if you have a question, no matter who you are, student, parent, teacher, Please talk about it. We only know about it if after the fact. Somebody needs to 
if there's a problem, they need to escalate it. It's almost like when you're at a, at a store and you want to talk to a manager. Please, if you have an issue, if there's something that we can deal with, we'd be happy to deal with it. It's not a matter of keeping it behind closed doors. It's not that we don't want to do anything about it. We would always want to work together and help each other. Thank you. Um, the, the, uh, did, did you talk about high school or uh, in general? Um, Stoughton High School oh, in high particular, school. Okay. yes. I, I think there is a huge issue uh, about the morale. The other day, one parent was telling me that um, their kids tell, can tell who's in the in crowd and who's in the out crowd. I said, what do you mean? They said, well, administration likes uh, certain teachers and uh, very uh, soft to them. And the other teachers are outside the circle and uh, they have uh, uh, poor morale. And then if the teachers have uh, poor morale, uh, you know, kids also have poor morale because they, 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 they go to school, you know, uh, barely waking up, and then uh, they see uh, teachers sulking, you know, it's, it uh, destroys their morale, it destroys uh, learning environment. One way uh, I gauge the uh, teacher's morale is I look at the, uh, in the budget, look at the uh, uh, substitute teacher uh, uh, salaries. So uh, if the, uh, the morale is so bad, the teacher uh, may feel sick. You know, if, if, I have my, if my morale is not right, I'm, I may get sick. And then you get a substitute, uh, you go to uh, school, and then you get all uh, uh, crowded into a cafeteria, you get few substitute teachers. So I definitely think there is a, a morale issue, and I think that's a school committee's responsibility for uh, not controlling the superintendent. Thank you. It definitely is the school responsibility for morale, and again, it's like I said, if, if, if it's reported to us, if it's brought to us, we can absolutely work through it and de try to deal with it. However, the, to rely on one parent's story to one person that has not been shared with us is really not fair to bring up at this point. I have no evidence, I've been seen no evidence, and I've been given no evidence that this isn't true, indeed true in this case. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Hill uh, seems to say there, there is the, deny that there is a morale issue. That's not what I said. Uh, well, you said there is only one example is not enough for you to uh, as a proof. But uh, as a school committee member, you should know. I'm sure the teachers uh, approach to you saying that there is a morale issue. I'm sure you have seen the substitute teacher salaries. I'm, I have seen uh, in the Stoughton News people are saying, you know, what's, what's all this uh, uh, teachers uh, not showing up for work. So there is definitely an issue, and it is the problem of the school committee because school committee sets the culture. Uh, it guides the superintendent to set the right culture. If the school committee says, you will not retaliate, you will not uh, punish, you will not uh, do different treatments, then the morale will be good because all our teachers are great. But if you try to uh, divide them into good people and uh, ink people and out people, that certainly destroys the morale. Thank you. Our final question, and this will go to Dr. Ural first. What are you looking forward to most about the new Stoughton High School? Oh, I'm uh, looking forward to uh, uh, seeing it. I have uh, uh, one child, he's a seventh grader, and uh, so he's uh, looking forward to uh, going uh, to the new high school. My older son is uh, a junior in high school, so I'm hoping that, uh, but he's going to uh, Southeastern. I'm hoping that uh, he will see the new building in uh, summer and uh, come back to Stoughton High School. So I think uh, everything looks good. Even the, um, uh, uh, you know, cost savings, you know, we're gonna be saving a lot of money on uh, uh, fuel bills. But again, this budget doesn't reflect that. It's uh, all the baked in. Um, so, uh, I think it's, it's, it's really uh, going to be uh, great. Thank you. Well, I happen to have a little advantage over Dr. Urell because like I said, we just did a tour this past Saturday and now it's still a lot of bricks and mortar and not everything's finished, but I am just, it's, it's as pretty as I pictured it in my head, even though it's not finished. Um, the gym, oh my gosh, the gym. It's not a field house, which I was, hoping my fingers for, but it's at least three times as big as what we have now. The, the basketball hoops are all installed, the, the d dividing curtain is hanging there waiting to go. The um, auditorium, 
again, we have 600, uh, 950 seats now. It's going to be 750 seats, so it's a little bit smaller, but the gymnasium will then be able to accommodate with the bleachers much more of the entire school population. The classrooms, they have science labs, real science labs. The music rooms, separate music rooms for the band, for the chorus, so they don't have to practice behind the stage. It's just, there's a black box theater. There's so many things that, is, and it's all in that, in that one building, and I just can't wait for it to open. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, and we're going to uh, closing statements. You'll have 90 seconds, and we'll start with Anita Hill. Okay. Thank you to Stoughton Chamber of Commerce and for SMAC, and to SMAC for providing this opportunity to be here tonight. It has been an honor to serve as a Stoughton School Committee member for these last three years. I am also a town meeting representative and have been since 2000. From the time that I have been, for the time that I have been on this committee, I have always been committed to the improvement of the education of our children, whether it was through policies or budgets or hiring and evaluating the superintendent. I have served on the negotiating committee for the STA Unit A, the teachers, and also for the custodians unit. During the last three years, I was involved with the hiring of two business managers and most recently our new superintendent of schools. I know our district has a new leader determined to help all students achieve their potential and I look forward to working with him beginning in July. I will use my experience, my energy, and my commitment to achieve collaboration and common sense problem solving for wherever issues arrive. My real life experience is in accounting. I am the HR and payroll manager at a small manufacturing company in Rockland. I'm very familiar with the financial end of the business budgets, hiring, payroll, employees, and the overall health of a business. We are responsible to keep our school district current in all federal and state requirements, but at the same time, we are responsible to our town residents. Our students deserve the best education our tax scholars can offer. Our residents deserve the utmost consideration <clears throat> excuse me, when it comes to spending their tax dollars. I hope to be reelected and continue to be the best school committee member I can be for the entire school district, the administration, the teachers, the students, and their parents, and for all Stoughton residents. Please vote for me on April 9th. Thank you. Dr. Ural. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for uh, showing up. I thank the uh, Chamber of Commerce, uh, Stoughton uh, TV, and uh, all the candidates for uh, making uh, tonight uh, happen. Uh, in the school committee race, we have uh, two seats. Uh, you see one of the incumbents here. I'm the non-incumbent. And uh, uh, so I'm uh, asking for one of your votes. You get to vote uh, for two people. Um, I, uh, as I said, uh, these are really uh, new and exciting times. Uh, we got a new high school, uh, new superintendent. So I like to be a part of that uh, 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 moment in our history. And I like to make a positive influence in affecting the school culture, affecting the administration culture, and uh, making the uh, lives of the students and teachers better because that's all, it's all about the teachers and the students and their contact together. I have uh, five priorities. Uh, I sort of mentioned it. One is uh, promoting the cooperation uh, with the, uh, uh, with the bo uh, board of selectmen and town meeting, I mean, uh, town manager uh, w to make it uh, under the slogan of uh, one town, one team. Uh, I like to uh, work towards uh, improving the credibility of the uh, uh, school committee and the administration. I like to work on the uh, diversity, promoting diversity. Uh, we have serious student achievement issue in certain areas. We, I'm sorry that nobody asked that question. And also protect the best interests of the children and uh, taxpayers as well. Thank you. On behalf of the Stoughton Chamber of Commerce, I would like to thank you both for attending tonight. And I would like to remind the viewers that election day is Tuesday, April 9th, and the polls will be open from 7 a.m. until 8 p.m., and SMAC will be broadcasting live election results that evening. And be sure to visit www.stoughtontv.com for all election coverage. We will take a quick break, and we'll be back shortly with the candidates for the Board of Selectmen. Welcome to the Stoughton Board of Selection, Selectmen um, portion of the Candidates Forum. <laughs> and our candidates for Selectmen are incumbent Rick Hill and former Selectman Joe McCriskey. And they are running for one seat. 
Uh, before we begin, I would like to go over the rules one more time. Each candidate will be given 90 seconds for a closing statement. Each candidate will be allowed 90 seconds to respond to each question, and you will have the opportunity for one rebuttal for 60 seconds, if you so choose. And let's get right into the questions. Of the following buildings, which do you think is the town's single top priority to address and explain why? Freeman Street Fire Station, the State Theater, the train station, or the post office? And we are going to start with Joe McCriskey. Thank you. The, uh, my priority is the fire station. We've heard in you know, different talks about kicking the can down the road and all these things. Um, the fire station has been talked about for many, many years, and there's been a Band-Aid approach taken to it um, in the interest of living within you know, our, our confines and the budget and so forth. Um, it's like any board, there's five individuals that sit on the Board of Selectmen, a lot of diverse opinions and views, and uh, it just so happens that boards haven't collectively made the decision uh, to just pull the trigger and put up a new fire station. Uh, that is my top priority, if elected, is the, the fire station. Uh, the police station, uh, as it currently sits, can be added onto within five years. The police chief stated she would need more people and more room in five, within five years. We own all the land that the police department sits on now. To the right, we could build onto that building at far less cost of integrating a new police station within the um, the building plan of this joint venture they want to do. And again, we'll live within our budget and uh, you know, save us some money. Thank you. Rick? Thank you, Michael. So the train station you'll hear about tomorrow night that uh, the Board of Selectmen is going to be signing documents um, for the deed and for the um, parking lot agreement. Uh, again, highly complex issue, um, something that required an awful lot of um, attention and um, uh, stick to to get it done. Uh, we're committed to get it done. We assigned one board member to pursue this and uh, we're kind of at the end of the rails here uh, with that project. So it's important and it's happening. I think uh, once that's done, then our appeal will be put out, well, first of all, to rehab that building and also to uh, then uh, get it in shape for our business to come in and run. Uh, so that's important. I think equally important is the fire station. We've talked about it. Um, uh, Joe just recited my ad from last week, kick the can down the road, and, and that's exactly what's happened. And I just, uh, I'm, I'm not understanding why that 90-year-old building uh, has taken this long to get attention and action. And that's why we have prioritized it uh, to, the head of the, to the head of the line. So we've got a bunch of priorities happening in downtown. The master plans uh, really defines what it is that we should be looking at. It's our guide. There are several other documents and studies that have been done that were also taken into consideration. Uh, to uh, pursue, and you've just heard of uh, the State Theater, but the, um, uh, the post office in tandem with Randall Savings Bank as, um, as a project as well. So lots of good things happening, and we're doing our best to make sure that we're not spending taxpayer money, per se, to, to do it. Thank you. Uh, our next question goes first to Rick. The town is in the process of negotiating a settlement with the former town manager. Are you for or against this, and why? Oh, okay. Um, I'm just trying to figure out what I can and cannot talk about. So the, um, the settlement, uh, the Board of Select uh, made a decision to make public uh, the, attorney, the attorney's discoveries and findings in this particular case. And we did that a few Mondays ago, two or three Mondays ago. Uh, so that everybody would have the information that, um, for the most part, we have to, to make a decision. Uh, the findings were, well, first of all, uh, the, the town council representing uh, uh, the town that won the lawsuit, which was our job to do, was to defend the town. We did. We won. The appeal has now come, and now we've reset the clock. It won't be one justice that two attorneys are presenting to. It's three justices that um, will now be able to call witnesses and to, you know, and certainly, um, um, you know, that keeps this town involved in this lawsuit for another 18 months. Uh, the projections are with lost wages that the settlement, uh, I mean, the, uh, the awards could be up to, um, uh, one to three point five million dollars. So we've got an opportunity to settle now at sixty-five thousand dollars. Not continue to drag this town through the pain and suffering of this thing. Not to have to admit any fault on either side about this thing, or risk another eighteen months of this process and 
um, potentially losing uh, the appeal uh, the, and then having to find out who are going to pay for it. So at this point, the, vote, the board is set to vote tomorrow night on that, and I'll be voting on that. Thank you. Joe, same question. Well, kind of one hand tied behind my back, and, uh, and Rick understands as well, is that I don't have access to the document, all the documents they're looking at. I did get about three quarters of the way through the 36-page document that was put out by KP Law, and uh, there's a lot of speculation in that report. Uh, they refer to different circumstances with other town managers in the past uh, that weren't relevant to this case. Um, again, uh, I would keep an open mind. You know, I don't want to do anything, and I've said before, uh, that uh, I was not in favor of renewing the town manager's contract, although wasn't uh, at that time able to take part in it uh, for some time. Um, and that was for different reasons. But I don't know what the board's looking at now. I don't have the other side's information. Uh, so if it was in the town's best interest, uh, you know, I'd, I'm not going to get out of town in trouble. But I, I, it's really unfair to be able to answer that question right now because I don't have all the information that everyone else has. And I think people that have known me in office knew the difference I had uh, with uh, the former town manager in several, several instances because some of them were public. Thank you. Michael, can I follow up? Absolutely. Thank you. So um, my opponent does have a conflict of interest, and it did not allow him to participate in, the, in not voting for the renewal of the contract, which is a big part of uh, the disagreement with what happened here with the separation. Um, and then subsequently, um, there are so many other pieces that, that, that affect you know, his ability to be able to participate in town government. So couldn't hire, couldn't participate in the fire chief, uh, the hiring of the, excuse me, the uh, police chief, couldn't hire, you know, um, do their review when it comes up, can't, couldn't hire the new town manager, couldn't do their review when it comes up, can't uh, participate in collective bargaining. There's just so many things that are affected here. But at the end of the day, um, you know, our job was to defend the town. We did that at this point. Now we've got a settlement in front of us that will stop this uh, pain and suffering in this town. And, um, you know, again, it's a lot of money, $65,000, but in the scheme of things, it seems to be the right thing to do. Thank you. So to follow up to that, um, you know, Rick talks about uh, that I can't vote. The only thing I cannot vote on, and I'm proud that my son became a member of the Stoughton Police Department and serves the community that I've served dating back to 1987. Uh, I'm proud of that. I'm proud of him. I cannot vote on the line item or collective bargaining for the Patrolman's Association. I would not be able to vote for appointing a police chief or a town manager. But the most part is anything in which my son has a direct financial gain. So I can vote on a lot in the police department. We've had past police officers, and we've had police officers, family members on the Board of Selectmen in the past, and they served with honor. And I will do just that. Thank you. The Joe's, next, Joe's son, by the way, does a great job. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> the next question goes to you first, Joe. What do you see as the future of Cedar Hill Golf Course? Well, <laughs> there's, there's a lot of people I know up there, and they are working their rear ends off to make that uh, a viable entity. Uh, I think that we have to think outside the box. I think that there are some programs now that are being proposed uh, to try and bring more youth involved there as well. Uh, we do have to address the uh, concessionaire. For a long time now, we've had a person up there paying no rent. The town actually had to buy equipment so that person could run the concession. Uh, they don't pay any utilities. They don't pay any rent. The town doesn't get a return on investment, a cut of anything. And I think that we have to try to get something where it's a viable entity for all of the town. Uh, I applaud the efforts of some members to try and get uh, youth involved through the high school golf team and, and youth groups in there to utilize it. Um, it's been there for a long time. It survives. But it's never really been something that we can look to and say, wow, what a gem in town, unless you're a golfer. We have to expand a little bit and make sure that it's a valuable entity for all of our residents. Thank you. Our uh, next question goes to you first, Rick. I, actually, should I answer that one first? You, sure. <laughs> yep, thank you. <laughs> thank my you. goal is, uh, for Cedar Hill, um, my view of it is to, to be able to play it and play it well. Um, I'm, I'm not a great golfer because I, I don't have great patience, but for golf for some reason I do. Uh, the Cedar Hill is kind of the jewel in the crown. Um, I, I see it as such a great um, uh, thing for the town to have and, and the, uh, a benefit for the folks here. Uh, we're working hard to make sure that we 
um, bring that course back up to speed. Uh, we've got a lot of people dedicated to that. Um, the, the projects that go on are funded through the enterprise account. The enterprise account looks like it needs to be funded out of town monies, but at the end of the day, it's because we apply indirect costs to that enterprise account, which by law you have to, but they're not real costs to the operation. So um, I'm happy that they're you know, funding their own operation. I think there's an article in, in uh, the uh, upcoming warrant to expand the sixth hole to make it much more difficult and more challenging for players that have been playing the course for a long time, which is great. Uh, the, um, the caterer that's up there, we, uh, we did just renew the contract from, that was put in place from the previous board and uh, you know, wanted them to uh, work a year to uh, see if they can't make a, a viable go of it. And yes, we, in, we invested in the, uh, the capital project, uh, the capital asset up there because it's the town's asset. So you know, if you've got a facility that you're providing, then it needs to be complete. So that's why the monies were invested. And again, being paid out of the enterprise fund debt line and retained earnings. Thank you. So as proof that SMAC never censors or edits anything, my mistake will stay intact. <laughs> you will see it in subsequent <laughs> airings. <laughs> and now going forward to the next question, uh, Rick. In the past few months, there have been a lot of discussion about purchasing the state theater through the use of eminent domain. Please explain what specifics in the eminent domain laws apply to the purchase of the theater. Well, uh, when we're acquiring any properties, there's always a line in there about um, eminent domain, um, friendly takings, for example. Uh, it's not our first choice. Our first choice is to engage with the, uh, the owner of the property uh, to see if we might be able to work on an agreement. This came to our attention back in the fall, and uh, you know, there was, it seemed that the property was imminent of imminent da uh, danger of being torn down. So we wanted to get in front of that, and um, we have... Uh, uh, spent a great deal of time and effort trying to um, first engage the owner who was out of, out of the country at the time for an extended period of time, um, unable to return uh, due to personal reasons. And then, you know, but his children were here and we established a contact with them with, uh, through our, our economic development director. So um, if we are able to acquire that property, we would, you know, our initial thought was that we do that with um, um, CPA money, uh, CPA money. But, uh, if you've heard, the redevelopment authority is, is, is um, creating urban development zones and uh, working with the Board of Selectmen to make that happen. Given that status change in that area, the redevelopment authority now will be able to help us and they have access to you know, bonding money that's not available today and other sources of funding which would be you know, a big help. So uh, we're looking at all of our options. You know, a problem at special town meeting was the immediacy of need. You know, now we've got some time to step back and, and work the problem but I think it's worth saving. Thank you. Joe? Could you give me the question again? Sure. Please. In the past few months, there's been a lot of discussion about purchasing the state theater through the use of eminent domain. Please explain what specifics in the eminent domain laws apply to the purchase of the theater. Well, last I knew when I read the eminent domain law years ago is that it had to be used for something of the public good. Uh, and it was basically for infrastructure, schools, public safety buildings, so forth, things like that, that was the good of the entire community. Well, unless John Morton got a letter back answering 26 questions that he presented to the board on October 11th, uh, I actually called John and I thanked him for his letter on how it, well written it was that it asked all the questions that unless he got answers to 26 questions, there's no plan, there's no numbers on the return on investment, they have no idea how the rent's gonna be collected, how the services are gonna be provided, who's gonna run it, what the ticket sales are, how they're gonna get the acts, who's gonna manage the acts, all these things that are in John's letter. That's not what you use eminent domain for. Not to tell somebody we know what's better for your property and we don't have a plan of what we're gonna do. $1.6 million minimum just for the purchase of the building, not a penny for renovations. And there'll be huge renovations needed there. So that, and then even the preparation. If anybody read uh, Dr. Camacho's email uh, back in November, where she criticizes the board for a lack of preparation, uh, among some other things. So these are two well-respected people in town that uh, have grave concerns about using taxpayer money for the purchase of a theater. I talked about the theater in 1998 the first time with the private, uh, private owner that was there at the time, and he could make it happen. Thank you. Would you like to respond, Rick? 
Sure. So um, there was a, um, uh, an engineer and a consultant that was brought in back in 2014 by the Friends of the Stoughton uh, uh, State Theater. And there was an extensive plan put together about soup to nuts, how it would uh, be brought back to life, and then managed to go forward. We've engaged with you know, the same previous owner and a number of other state theaters or theaters that have been con converted um, back into uh, private use uh, so that um, you know, they were uh, a key contributor to the, to the, to the community. And that's, that's the point of it all. The master plan has identified the state theater as, as, as a key focus point for the downtown. If we can make it happen, you know, we won't make a bad decision if, you know, if, if, you know, if that's what's out there. But um, the renovations are you know, upwards of uh, $8 million or more. And so again, we'd put out an RFP, if, if acquired, uh, to bring in a group to be able to manage that facility, raise the capital to do the renovations, to bring the city back to, um, uh, um, uh, to uh, its original status and you know, make it profitable. Thank you. Would you like to respond? Yeah, Rick is correct. 2014, there was an extensive plan done. Didn't have any dollar amounts, though. It was so, it was vague at best. And we're here in 2019. There was a meeting in October of 19, 2019. And uh, there was a gentleman, I think he's here again tonight, uh, who was in the room back in October of 2018 and asked these questions. They could not be answered by the Friends of the State Theater. Okay, so nothing has happened differently unless some document is there that nobody's seen yet that answers those questions. Again, I don't believe the town of Stoughton taxpayers need to be in the real estate business. Let the private sector dictate what happens. I agree that I think the theater could be a very good use of downtown. I think it will bring people to downtown. But 15 seconds, uh, I think that we, are, we need to be looking beyond downtown as well. We shouldn't be just focusing on downtown. There's a lot we can still do. Thank you. This next question goes to you first, Joe. Currently, the town is facing a budget shortfall. The selectmen voted to cut approximately $1.7 million from the school department budget as part of the solution to the shortfall. Do you agree with this strategy? And if not, where would you suggest cuts be made? Well, that's, I mentioned that last week in our previous debate, is that uh, school, one school committee member told me, and she said uh, you know, that there were other people that felt this way, is that uh, the relationship with the Board of Selectmen is at best fractured. Uh, and it's not good, there's no communication. So what we've got to do is agree to disagree. We've got to come together and talk nuts and bolts. We're on the threshold of one of the greatest things that's ever happened in Stoughton with the building of the new high school. And we need to find ways to, to put resources out for the school department because there's going to be growing pains. We're not going to be able to project every expense of this new building. We don't even know the challenges that lie ahead of us. And if we can't have two boards sit together and come down with realistic numbers to try and make this work so that we can go to town meeting united, we fail everybody in town, both groups. We fail the town meeting representatives who are there to vote a budget. We fail the finance committee that are there to make re recommendations to town meeting. And we fail the taxpayers. And this is what we've got to do. I can sit and talk with anyone. I don't have to agree with everyone. We may disagree. We may walk away disagreeing, but we have to come together as both boards and represent the people that we run for and we tell them we're going to work hard for you. We're going to stand alone. We're going to do what we've got to do to you know, protect your tax dollars and grow the town. It's time we put our money where our mouth is. Thank you. Would you like to respond? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I, I think we're all able to speak with each other. Hell, I live with one of them. So. Um, I think that the boards uh, have a meeting scheduled this week, or it's actually it's next week, uh, with the vice chair and chair of uh, finance committee, the school committee, and the the, uh, the board of selectmen are going to sit to uh, finish working through the deltas in uh, the budget cap. So, um, so the groups are working together. Um, I didn't vote for this budget, as you'll probably see, uh, because I thought it needed a little bit more time to figure out some additional opportunities for us to find. Um, uh, savings and um, other revenue. We've only got the governor's budget um, and House One. We're still waiting for House Two, which is the Senate, and then we'll, we'll Ways and Means will we'll negotiate that out, and hopefully there'll be some additional funding there. Uh, and we've come up with a bunch of ideas in the meantime. So I think it a little need a little bit more uh, time to gestate, and and that's what's happening right now. And I think at the end of the day, um, the work will get done, the job will get done, and and again, our continuing good relations with the school committee will um, will go forward. Thank you. Would you like to respond? 
not to beat a dead horse. We've had this issue in the past. I don't know, Rick, has any member of the Board of Selectmen sat, has the board sat with the school committee in the recent three months to talk about the budget at all? Oh, yeah. Yeah, as a matter of fact. School committee, um, okay. I, yeah, I had to actually, I was out of town but phoned in for that meeting, but it okay. was, uh, okay. was back in um, January, I believe. Yeah. I, ju I think that we've got to think outside the box of what we can do, and it may be, you know, both boards, you know, kind of eating a little crow, because I think we're, we're on, we have the potential to be on a, a slippery slope. A brand new high school, we can project cost, but there's so many things that we're going to be able to do in this new high school that we haven't been able to do before. That's going to cost money. You know, we have you know, our music department, the performing arts. They're going to have so much more room and, and ability to do things. It's going to cost money. I mean, and I think we've got to start looking at what this is going to cost us. And it may be that we have to reassess how we handle the budget, how we look at uh, new revenue and new growth, which is an area that we haven't really even touched the surface of, is Thank new you. growth. Rick, we, would you like to respond? Yeah, please. Um, so a lot of our focus is on, on new and expanded revenue opportunities for the town. Um, so new growth certainly would be an area. Um, one of the things that the master plan directs us to do in its economic development component is to look at zoning and to make sure that we've got the, uh, the particularly the commercial industrial uh, parcels in town zoned correctly so that we don't have what's, hap what's happened at uh, Cushing Street being, uh, you know, having a recycling plant be, be built across the street from the middle school. So that's a huge thrust of, of what our efforts are. This year we had uh, 1.6 million in expenses coming up in retirement and um, insurances that was just unanticipated. And some prior period, period billing, which was a mistake you know, from the state insurance agency. So, so we had to work through that and that was, that's a tough nut. You've always got to you know, figure out the solution. It's, at the end of the day, there's only so much money. Uh, so we knew that when we hired so many public safety f officials that we had to have a revenue plan to support it and that's what we are working fervently on right now to make sure that we have it because it was the right decision and there are other things that we need to do to, uh, to expand um, you know staffing and, and coverage so thank you this next question goes to you first Rick what are some ways the town could generate more tax revenue uh, well I just um, um, alluded to a big compo a big piece of it so the more commercial development, industrial development that we can do uh, certainly helps us. And, um, you know, we, uh, there's a project in the warrant uh, that's going to be asking for funding for a study for a sewer line down Park Street. Controversial issue. The reason was is because the town did an awful job at, at trying to sell that project in the past. And, um, uh, you know, the intimation was it's going to be twenty and $30,000 betterments for the people that living along that line. Well. We had a bunch of uh, um, uh, folks from uh, uh, businesses come to us um, back in 2012, uh, and actually went out to their own expense and hired an engineering firm to do a study about that and what, it would, what would be the financial returns to the community. We also have, you know, a community plan that was done back in 2004. We have a park, uh, a Route 27 study that was done by the. Um, uh, the O'Connelly Planning Council, there's, there's a bunch of studies saying what should be done um, with that particular road and the investment needs to be made. And, uh, and that's the, the path we're heading down. If we can get a $2.5 million uh, grant that we've applied for and, you know, the return on investments that have been calculated in the current runs um, all, all help to support that, that project and then generate income for the town, revenue, and uh, reduce the burden particularly in the water sewer areas, uh, to the residents so we can pay for the capital projects and then start reducing that rate at some point downstream. Thank you. Joe? Well, I've said this before, and uh, I believe we spend way too much time talking about new spending. Let me ask you a question. When you think of development and the development that we want, retail, low services that we provide, instead of residential where we have to put more kids in schools, roads, public services, police, fire. We want to attract things like other towns have done. And different than big business, we look at retail as a good thing close to the highway. When you think of Hingham, when you think of Westwood, you think of Avon, you think of Canton, if you look at the businesses that they have, in Hingham they have the shops at Derby Plaza, most everybody knows them. They also have the shipyard project down at the, the old shipyard in um, Federal uh, Depot for goods and services. Uh, now it's home to Wahlburgers, condos, mall areas. 
Uh, you have Westwood, University Station, where Wigman's, all these different retail stores are. People don't know those towns for their downtown. We've got to, and downtown is important to us, but we've got to think outside downtown. We've got to bring in the revenue that all that private development is going to other towns when we have the same roads and infrastructure capability that we have in North Stoughton. We also have, within years to come, we have an access road that when we were working with the Redevelopment Authority with the Board of Selectmen, we planned on when IKEA came to town that there's enough area to access the road to the left of IKEA and go right through all the industrial land that we have. Thank you. Would you like to respond, Rick? Yeah, so again, you know, I think revenue is certainly at the crux of the issue here, and, you know, we're looking for base hits. So um, it'd be great to, to have a home run and bring IKEA in again or bring in, uh, you know, the businesses that are out at North Stoughton. But um, our economic development director has been doing a terrific job of trying to make sure that, you know, we're presenting all our available opportunities to um, outside private investors that, um, that are there. But cleaning up the downtown is huge. If, uh, you know, you get um, 40 brand new storefronts down there all paying full uh, tax on, you know, regenerated um, buildings that are down there. Uh, because they're drawn to that area because it's been cleaned up and there's now green space and there's now, um, you know, multi-use housing down there and, um, you know, all the things that make it a great place, that brings in a huge amount of tax revenue. So, you know, again, we're looking for base hits. It'd be great to have home runs, but um, we're looking at incremental revenue expansion so that we can take the burden off of the taxpayers. All the projects we talk about are funded with generally non-taxpayer money, levy money, et cetera, grants and CPA and RDA, et cetera, so. Thank you. Would you like to respond, Joe? Well, I'm hoping that uh, when we get this all done, it's great to have base hits, but I think we need a big poppy, too. You know, so when the bases are loaded, we can knock one out of the park. We're the first exit off of Route 24 South, the gateway to Metro South. There's development that's tried to come here before, but wasn't able to do it. And we remember the project up on Turnpike Street where Dunkin' Donuts is. Everybody says, how come that's taken so long? Ask the developer. The Sherman family stopped, develop they stopped the project. They sold it because they said we were too tough to deal with. Don't remember, there was a Dunkin' Donuts up there that moved. They were forced to relocate their building, maybe 100 feet, because of the zoning issue. Well, number one, why did the zoning issue pop up? Why wasn't it caught when it was built? And I can't believe that a large corporation like that would just build a new building. And I think most of the people in this room will remember the two Dunkin' Donuts. You know, and that's just not good for our town. We send the wrong message to developers. We've got to bring them in and say, make us money. We heard the Redevelopment Authority mention it earlier. It can be done. Thank you. The next question goes to... Okay, this goes to Joe first. Earlier this evening, we asked the candidates for, for Redevelopment Authority what their priorities were for development other than the downtown. What would your priorities be? North Stoughton. Redevelopment Authority did a plan uh, back around 2007 uh, that would, uh, we brought people in as well uh, to max out the Page Street area and to look at the addition going in through, if the property became available, uh, going in towards Ikea. At some time, that property is all going to be available. R right now, we have hotels going in North Stoughton. We have areas of Turnpike Street beyond Target to the left that can be developed. We have Page Street to the right that can be developed. Turnpike Street. You know, going up the right side towards Page that can be developed. But we haven't brought in anybody from the private sector. Bring a developer in like we did back in the, in the 70s with the um, North Stoughton Technology Center. Bring somebody in to work with us. Let them know, do what they do. Steve Jobs said it all the time. We hire good people and we let, let them tell us what to do. We need to do that. I'm not a developer. I don't think Rick's a developer. We've got to bring people in that know what they can do, what they can bring, and get, tell us what we need to provide for infrastructure to get the specific need. I've heard biotech being mentioned. That's a great thing, but that's planning to get it 10 years down the, low, down the road. And there's not a lot of movement for biotech out of Boston to the South Shore yet. So that's an idea. But we can get the retail. Retail's coming here now because of Stockwell Drive, the Christmas tree shop. I mean, the other areas that are building up as well, we can get some of that. We have prime land as well. So we've got to be planning for that and bring somebody in that can help us, not Thank us you. tell them what to do. Rick? So this is a question asked of the Redevelopment Authority about what their priorities would be. And now you're asking what, you know. Yes. 
what, what mine would be. So, mm-hmm. um, again, part of our problem in the past is, is that we just lose focus, you know, and boards of, direct, uh, boards of, uh, boards of selection change, <laughs> and, um, uh, and we just don't have our eye on the ball all the time. The downtown has to get fixed, and that's my priority is to make sure that happens. Separately, we're working on other initiatives. So, yes, biotech um, uh, uh, status has, is what we're pursuing at this point, and I think we will qualify for um, a gold status level, which is like down the street. That's going to happen very, very shortly um, for uh, the North Stoughton area. So we're working hard to make sure that happens, and then what are the next steps to become platinum level? Um, so again, there are a lot of things that are happening in tandem. Huge focus right now um, is, is on the downtown uh, to, you know, to drive that to completion so that and again, this is, this, is, this is all long-term planning and thinking. And, you know, our windows here are this big. So um, how do we, you know, make these projects drive to completion, live beyond today, and, um, and you know, be something that the town's going to be uh, proud of? Uh, because the downtown's a morale issue at this point. And that's why we stepped in to Malcolm Parsons and said, you know, enough's enough. And um, we, were, we were ready to, do, to take whatever action we needed to to move that project down the street. And sure enough, on the night we were going to discuss it, the owner showed up and, and a few other folks. And, um, uh, you know, that project's going to open in the spring or break ground. So, Thank you. Joe, would you like to respond? No. Not. Okay. We're going to the final question. And this goes to Rick first. The Charter Review Committee has been meeting recently and the selectmen have discussed the charter at recent meetings. What potential changes would you like to see in the town charter? This is a softball, right? <clears throat> so having been the, the chair of the Charter Review and involved with the Charter Review Committee for 18 years, um, you know, certainly I hold it in the same regard as I do the Constitution. You're going to change it. You need a big reason to change it. Uh, there was some uh, uh, review of the charter that went on uh, about five years ago uh, through legal counsel with a bunch of cleanup changes which all makes sense. Um, so, uh, you know, one of the, you know, several of the other things that need to be um, uh, addressed are, uh, let's talk about terminating the fire, the town manager's language in the charter. And if it's not strong enough or significant enough, then, then let's fix that. Um, I, I had proposed uh, two weeks, three weeks ago to have the Board of Selectmen put the charter on, their, uh, on the agenda for us to review and then set some times uh, tables to review it and to get some, um, share the feedback with the, uh, um, uh, the Charter Review Committee and then see if we've got time a year from this coming town meeting to formulate some articles to put in place. So uh, I think that there's a, a bunch of, of opportunities. I think that, um, you know, the fact that I was on the, you know, the chairman of that committee for, 30, for 18 years kind of speaks to the problem. I think that, you know, uh, there should be term limits. I don't think that people should be in office for, for years and years and years and years, and uh, we should fix that. Uh, I think that the town monitor and the finance committee and its appointments already needs, needs to be at least reviewed and looked at. You know, I hate that the town moderator has to run every year, uh, but there's a reason for that. There's a, there's a design for that, and how do we you know, look at more broad-stroking broad options there? Thank you. Joe? Well, my question will be very, very quick. I don't think the Board of Selectmen should put much input into the charter reform. Now, let town meeting and let the residents say what should be done to run their community. The people that are here, we're biased, we see it. You can tell people and answer questions, but I don't think the Board of Selectmen should be involved with drafting updates to the town charter. Let that be done by the legislative body of the town, which is town meeting, and the residents of the town. Let town meeting draft that through the residents, being the legislative entity, and do what's right for the town. But that being said, what I want to make sure, too, that we, we talk about is, you know, it hasn't really had much question, is the revenue of our town moving forward. You know, we have uncollected real estate taxes that have doubled this year. We need to focus on getting that money that's out there and due to the town back into the coffers. It's doubled. Tax liens have gone down, but the uncollected revenues is here. It's downloaded today from the Department of Local Services, and it talks about our tax rate. Our tax rate has gone up from 2016 to 2019 to the average income, the average household of $1,132. That's here. The last two years alone, 2018 and 2019, we've had the average tax bill has gone up $874. Anyone wants to see it? I'll show it to you after it's over. We've got to think outside the box. We've got to bring another argument 
whether it's talking about downtown, we got to think further. We have to go out and get more development. Thank you. Rick, would you like to respond? Sure. Um, so the Board of Selectmen is a policy board, um, and the legislative board uh, looks to the Charter Review and the Board of Selectmen for direction. So they just can't all kind of work amongst themselves and come up with changes to the Charter. So anything we propose is going to have to work through the Charter Review Committee and then town meeting and then a vote of the voters. So there's a safe process in place to make that all happen. And certainly there'll be public hearings held and feedback from the, 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 uh, the town folks, et cetera. So I, I, I'm pretty confident in the process. The, the, uh, the tax revenues, again, are, are, a, uh, are always of a great concern. You know, the, the property values in the town have gone up. You know, we haven't raised two and a half beyond two and a half, except for the debt exclusion that was done for the high school, which is a burden to the folks. So one of the things that we did was, again, something that we did on the high school building committee, pulled together every single uh, um, tax assistance program that was available uh, to seniors and, and veterans in particular. Uh, we put all of those into one place. We, we've been on a tour through town presenting that to our seniors and uh, veterans, and it's been very successful. Thank you. Joe, would you like to respond? Yeah, just a, a quick follow-up again, is that the last two years alone, average tax bill went up $874. We did. We went around. The Board of Selectmen went around and told veterans and, and the seniors what's available to them. What I'm saying is instead of telling them what they can go after, it's our responsibility as your elected officials to bring in revenue so we don't have to even worry about that. You know, and that's been my problem with we, we're, in my opinion, we're shy of what we can do as a community. We've got to get beyond this table and walk outside the borders of Stoughton and bring resources into the community and not just be focused on what we have to spend to get the return on investment. That's a very shallow view. We've got to get outside the, the, the borders of our town and bring resources in. It can be done. It's been done before. Thank you. All right, it's time for our closing statements, and we will start with Joe McCrisky. Well, thank you to um, the Chamber of Commerce, Michael, to you, and the folks at SMAC for this interview with the selection candidates. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm running, there's been a lot of talk. People ask me why I'm running. And it's not to tear down the good things that we're trying to do, it's to try to add to it and make it better. I want to work with the members of the Board of Selectmen. I want to work with the Redevelopment Authority. I served three years as chairman of the Redevelopment Authority. And when we were there, the Redevelopment Authority was on the front line, as me being chairman, of going in and working with IKEA to make sure the access road was put in so we could get future development out of it. When Target came there, uh, I was there, and they introduced me at their ribbon cutting. And I'll quote them. They said, when we first met Joe McCriskey, to say he wasn't on our good list is a shortcoming. But then they also said that we had the best relationship when we made them install pedestrian lights, additional sidewalks, and instead of just paving over intersections, they actually put shrubbery in there. And we actually got the uh, park done and cleaned up, equipment taken down that had been there for years, and a fence put up at the little park that used to be the, uh, the Clapp School. I'm sorry, the Capon School. And uh, that can be done, but you've got to walk outside the Board of Selectmen's table and the, the network that's here. I'm excited as heck about our new town manager. She has a vision, she's got energy, and she's, she's willing to stand up on her own. We haven't had that in a long time. I think that's going to make a difference, and I look forward to serving with her and the members of the Board of Selectmen. Thank you. Rick? Thank you, Michael, and thank you to the Chamber of Commerce and Terry and his team and Cynthia Pizera and um, also SMAC for hosting this program. It's, it's, it's an absolutely needed uh, function in our town. So our debate is about learning our record and positions as, as candidates. Um, but the project this board, this board is currently working on have crossed paths with so many boards in the past and, um, uh, and have not been addressed. Uh, they've not been prioritized, so here we are today. Uh, the hard part of defining um, the role of the Board of Selectmen is the path forward. Formulating a plan, sticking to it, correct, course correcting is necessary. This is the area that my opponent has failed at repeatedly. He had no plan then, he has no plan now. You haven't heard one solid plan, one very specific step of what was going to be taken to, uh, to, uh, to address the issues in town. There are a lot of great 
high level thinking here, but what are the specifics? And you know, the proofs in the pudding, and, and you know, that's what we're doing. And you know, the, uh, uh, the projects with the, um, uh, the post office and the, um, uh, the, the bank, the, you know, the one point, the million dollars in grants we've gotten for facades upgrades and other uh, issues in the downtown to help them, the grants for the railroad station, the grants for the post office, working with the RDA for um, an urban renewal grant, sewer project to provide new sources of revenue, pursuing $2.5 million grant for uh, that project, upcoming traffic redesigns in the town town from here from Monk Street out to Walnut Street where the new street light will be put in right at the library there. So, Pushing hard to address fire and police facilities, working for the R with the R R RGA, completing outreach to seniors and veterans, all are important. Thank you. We refuse to be complacent, and uh, we're time. addressing these head on. Thank you so much. I'd like to thank Rick Hill and Joe McCriskey for attending tonight on behalf of the Chamber of Commerce. I'd like to also thank all of the candidates who appeared tonight for caring enough about Stoughton to run for office and to do what they can to make a difference. Election day is Tuesday, April 9th. And polls are open from 7 a.m. until 8 p.m. And SMAC will be broadcasting live election results that evening. I'd like to thank Christine Yakabuchi, our timekeeper. And I'd also like to thank Jeffrey Pickett for running all of the controls tonight uh, and directing this candidates forum. Uh, thank you to the, the Chamber of Commerce for inviting me to attend this evening. I appreciate that. And um, be sure to visit www.stoughtontv.com for all election coverage. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight.